In today's episode, our journey takes us across the country to explore force in varied geographical settings. Our quest is to understand the craft, architecture and engineering of these forts. How is a site for a fort picked? How were they constructed to protect entire cities or garrisons and what architectural features were needed to withstand a siege by enemies for months? Hi, I am Sneha Gupta and welcome to our show. In this episode of Building Blocks of Bharat, we will travel from Maharashtra to Delhi and then to Rajasthan, where some of India's mightiest and most architecturally sophisticated forts are located. Old ancient trade routes. Interestingly, it is the only fort along India's western coast that remained undefeated despite the Dutch, British, and the Marathas who waged more than 13 campaigns to capture it. As we approach the fort, we realize that we cannot see the entrance gate. It's only when the walls of the fort start towering 12 meters above us do we get our first glimpse of the magnificent gate of Murud with its steep steps. This is an important architectural and engineering feature. This feature alone addressed two critical aspects that would help protect the fort. Firstly, this ensured that the entrance was protected from any direct cannon fire. Secondly, the enemy would need to approach within 12 meters of the main gate by boats to even get a glimpse of it, thereby protecting any assault on the front gate. This was also the perfect distance for the massive cannons that protected Murud to obliterate the enemy. It's low tide, so our Dao anchors about 15 meters from the fort's gate and we walk along one of Murud's massive walls to reach the main entrance. The lower foundation of the fort shows signs of wear due to the constant battering of the waves through the centuries. The fort was first built in the 15th century by a local fisherman on a huge rock on the sea. The idea was to protect his community from sea pirates. However, the Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar had his eye on this fort and saw the fort was captured by the Siddhis who were chieftains to the Ahmednagar kings. And it was they who built the present stone fort and ruled it for the next few centuries. The name of the fort, Murud Janjira. Janjira is likely to be a corruption of the African word Jazira, which means island. As Arjun takes the first step inside the fort, he notices that the entrance is flanked by a panel on one side depicting elephants trapped by a single tiger. On the other side is an image of two tuskers fighting each other as two lions look on. These were the emblems of the city rulers.
The fort itself is spread across 22 acres. It is made of stones bonded together by a mixture of lead, sand and gold. The fort has 19 bastions, which are still intact and many of them have cannons pointing towards the sea. The main buildings of the fort are now in ruins. For nearly 600 years, it was occupied with all the necessary facilities like palaces, quarters for officers and soldiers and their families, a mosque and a temple two 18 meters deep natural freshwater lakes and many wells. On the fort's ramparts are over 200 cannons made locally and also of European origin. There are three major cannons protecting the entrance. These were built of five metals and can lob a cannonball far into the sea. One of the big cannons is famous for the fact that it never gets heated, despite taking the brunt of the sun for hours. The fort's well is a marvel as it contains sweet water, despite being in the middle of the sea. In fact, it is used to provide water to tourists and we decided to try it. It was fresh and cool. Within the fort, are two massive freshwater tanks. These are predominantly rain-fed and were constructed to provide water to the entire population of Murud Janjira for days and end. The architects and builders of Murud Janjira carefully planned the layout of the fort after studying the daily rise and fall of tides. Ocean tides are the interchanging patterns of rise and fall of sea level compared to land level. In 1687, Sir Isaac Newton explained that ocean tides happen as a result of the gravitational attraction of the sun and the moon on the oceans of the earth. The gravitational force exerted by the sun on the earth is only 46% that of the moon, making the moon the single most important factor for the creation of tides. The moon's gravitational force pulls the water in the ocean towards it and this causes the bulge towards the moon. The bulge on the other side of the earth opposite the moon is caused by the moon pulling the earth away from the water on that side. These two correspond to high tide and low tide. If you are on the coast and the moon is directly overhead, you should experience a high tide. Since the earth completes its rotation in 24 hours, you will experience low tide and high tide within six hour intervals. So after six hours, there will be first low tide, after 12 hour, second high tide, and after 18 hours, second low tide. These time intervals can change depending upon the location on Earth. If you remember, Arjun entered the fort in the morning when the tide was low, so the Dao had to be anchored a fair distance away. It's now evening, and as we wait for our Dao to return, the tide is high. The boats bringing in tourists are coming right onto the steps of the Murud Janjira's massive entrance. The path that we took earlier to approach the fort lies submerged, as are the steps that led to the fort. Isn't this amazing? Our next stop takes us to New Delhi, the capital of India. We are heading to the oldest fort in this city, the Purana Killa. There are monuments in Delhi older than the Killa, and there are certainly more impressive ones. But it's unlikely that exists another place in the city where history runs as deep. In its current form, the fort was built by the second Mughal Emperor Humayun and the Afghan Sher Shah Suri, rivals who ruled Delhi in the mid-16th century. Umayyu began the fort's construction in 1533, but he was deposed after a few years by Sher Shah Suri. Umayyu then recaptured the fort 15 years later. 
However, what makes the fort unique is that it is believed to have been built on the hallowed site of Indraprasth, the shimmering realm between myth and history. Evidence of human occupation has been found here, which dates back to 1500 BC, according to the Archaeological Survey of India. If we look at the layout of this sprawling structure, the plan is irregularly oblong with a circuit of about 2 kilometers. The towering walls of the old fort rise to a height of 18 meters. The thick ramparts crowned by merlins have three gateways provided with bastions on either side. It was surrounded by a wide moat connected to the Yamuna River. A part of it can still be seen. This fort is also a marker in the change in building materials used in Delhi. Around the 16th century, there was a shift from using Delhi quads to working with marble and sandstone. Delhi quads was the traditional building material used in Delhi and its neighborhood throughout the ancient and early medieval period. We can see it in monuments like the Qutub Minar, the Alay Darwaza, the mausoleums of Nasiruddin Muhammad and of Gyasuddin Tughlaq at Tughlaqabad. But later, Delhi monuments like Humayun's tomb and Red Fort are made largely of marble and sandstone. Monuments like Purana Kila are interim monuments where sandstone of different hues was combined with limited use of marble. The advantage of sandstone and marble is that delicate carving is possible on both stones. Quads, on the other hand, is a basaltic rock of volcanic origin. The molten lava cools into hard rock composed of large crystals. The crystals prevent any kind of fine carving because the stone will flake or crack when worked upon with chisels. Here we will take a short break. After the break, we will discuss more on craft, architecture and engineering of these forts. Welcome back after the break. Let's again begin our journey with India's mightiest and most architecturally sophisticated forts. If we look at the outer wall of the fort, it is built with red sandstone. The walls have three traumatic entrances, but the Bara Darwaza is the most impressive. This faces west and is used as the entrance to the fort even today. All three gates are double-storied structures constructed using sandstone and surrounded by two large semicircular towers adorned with colored marble embellishments and blue tile work. At the north and south gates of the Purana Kila, you will find Islamic pointed arches combined with Hindu chhatris and brackets. One can see the understanding of geometry in the patterns across this fort. The architecture within the fort is a fine blend of the Hindu elements together with Muslim style of arches and domes. To see this, we will focus on one structure, the intricately patterned Kilaya Quran Mosque built by Sher Shah in 1542, which is surprisingly well preserved. The main facade of the building, which has an arch surrounded by Saval Jawab, which are sets of arches on either side of the main arch. The outer ones are made of Delhi quartzite, which, because it's very hard, is notoriously difficult to carve. And the inner ones of red sandstone. One can see the pointed arch that Islamic structures used so widely in use here. 
appointed arches form by the meeting of two arcs of a circle which meet at the apex forming a triangle. This may be either isosceles or equilateral. To give a smooth curve at the base of the arch, the center of these arcs must obviously be on the same level as the springing points. Varying the arc length and the position of the center relative to the height of the arch will control the proportions and height of the arch. The advantage to using a pointed arch rather than a circular one is that the arch action produces less thrust at the base. This innovation allowed for taller and more closely spaced openings. Along with the arches, the entrance also had little jarokas, bands of carving, carved medallions and inlays of white marble decorate these arches. With the enclosure, the prayer hall has five magnificent openings with horse-shaped arches. As in most Mughal structures, there are carefully constructed water bodies within the fort. Since the fort stood on an elevation, the main step well had to be dug deeper and has 89 steps descending down 22 meters at an incline. The hammam or bathhouse had hot and cold water provisions. Even today, one can see the terracotta pipes which carried the water. Let's end our journey through Purana Kila with the graceful octagonal red sandstone Sher Mandal. Built by Sher Shah on one of the first observatory towers of Delhi. It was used by Himayun as a library. This was also the place where he died after slipping down its stairs in 1556. We now make way to explore one of India's finest fort cities, Chittorgarh. It is part of the six hill forts of Rajasthan and on the World Heritage List of UNESCO. Chittorgarh was built by various Maurya rulers in the 7th century. It stands perched on top of a 180 meter elevated hill. The fort is the largest in India in terms of area and is spread across 700 acres. It spans 3 kilometers in length and has an outer circumference of 13 kilometers. The fort's defensive architecture is a combination of solid fortifications combined with the clever use of the hill's natural defenses. How do hill forts usually work? A hill fort is a fortified refuge or defendant settlement located to exploit a rise in elevation or defensive advantage. The fortification usually follows the contours of a hill and this fort uses the natural defenses offered with the landscape, hills, deserts, rivers and dense forests. These natural advantages were reinforced by structural ones. The 4.5 km walls with integrated circular enforcements are constructed from dressed stone masonry in lime mortar and rise 500 meters above the plain. The geologically old land of Rajasthan is rich in different kinds of hard rocks. With the ready availability of high quality stone, the use of brick was almost unknown. It was easy for the Rajasthani builder to construct strong and beautiful forts, palaces and temples. The full extent of the Rajasthani stone cutter's skill can be seen in the richness and beauty of the large number of sculptures found in the temples built in ancient and medieval times. The fort has many stunning buildings with multiple levels, like Rani Padmani's palace. The biggest building here is the palace of Rana Kumb, where the Johar of Rani Padmani is believed to have taken place. The fort also has two stunning towers, the Vijay Stamb, a beautifully carved 
nine story tower built by Rana Kumbh to commemorate his victory over the Muslim rulers of Malwa and Gujarat in 1440. The tower is 37 meters high and stands on a 3 meter high base. It is an architectural marvel and is visible from any section of the town below. To reach the top of the tower, you have to climb 157 steps. The second tower is called the Kirti Stam, is dedicated to Rishabh, the first Tirthankara of Jainism. One of the most crucial requirements of a fort was a regular supply of water to ensure self-sufficiency during a siege which could last for many months. The planner of Chitorgar fort clearly kept this in mind. The fort had 84 water bodies, out of which about 22 still exist today. In fact, often Chitorgar fort is also called a water fort. In forts like this in Rajasthan, where there is scanty rainfall and natural resources of water scarce, a variety of water storage devices were worked into the fort architecture. These include talabs, kunds and bowries, step wells. When we visited the fort in the heat of summer, a natural spring was still gushing into the famous Gormuk Reservoir. This water is said to be sacred. So, of over 700 hectares of the fort, 40% was covered with water bodies and reservoirs. The average reservoir depth is about 2 meters. Taken together, this means these reservoirs can store about 4 billion liters of water annually. In a year of more than normal rainfall, enough water would be stored to last for months, even years. An army of 50,000 could live in the fort for four years without fear of thirst. The story of India is riddled with tales of conquest, control and the rise and fall of empires and forts across the country stand testimony to these narratives. These forts are full of sagas of romance, valor, inevitable deceit and intrigues of court politics. But most importantly, they symbolize the progression of military architecture, new cities, innovative town planning and the careful utilization of natural resources. So that's it for today. Please share your views or suggestions on feedback at indiascience.in. Till then, good day.